kind of just decided as I said a little bit earlier just to kind of make as much of the, the light situation as we can. But um, kind of just quick three announcements. Um, we've got the men's meetings on Wednesdays in March um, that is uh, happening every Wednesday in March basically. <laughs> and we've been having two so far um, and it's been a really, really blessed time. Um, spoken to guys every time that have been there. I've been there myself and it's just been awesome. It's really been good. And so I want to encourage you, bring a friend that hasn't come yet or whatever and um, make it a big party. The other one is uh, the date of the 23rd of March will be uh, our next corporate worship event. Um, that'll be here at the venue. So that'll be Tuesday the 23rd of March and that'll be um, at 7 o'clock. And then normally runs to about 9ish. I um, want to invite you guys out to that as well. Uh, the same rules apply with regards to obviously uh, regulations, uh, um, the 50% capacity, and so we'll have all those other things in place too. Uh, and then the other one is an important one, is, is that as a church, we're going through this kind of uh, transition time and the juries are preparing to uh, head back to the States, right? Um, they've served with us for nearly nine years, most of us. We can really say most of us have got a quite a deep personal relationship with the church. And um, so I'll, we want to put it out to the church and saying with their leaving, there's a lot of financial uh, costs involved, uh, a lot of things that need to kind of, they're going to have a container come and uh, pick up uh, some of their stuff and head it back to the States. Uh, for, you know, and all the, those kind of things. And the church is also contributing and being a part. But we wanted to put it out to the church that if, Kind of like being the receiving end of, of their ministry for a long time that if you're wanting to contribute financially that um, the same uh, uh, kind of bank account that is used for tithes and offerings and those kind of things um, you can just reference that cheery move or, or cheery trip or whatever and uh, that can be put aside if there's something cash that's also cool you can give it to um, to them yourselves um, and then I think, uh, yeah, that's what we really wanted to put out to the church and, and to be involved in, in loving them right up until kind of we, we put them on the, on the airplane and, uh, and we, yeah, anyway, we can shed tears <laughs> a little bit uh, later on. And, um, but anyway, why don't you turn in your Bibles to chapter 13 in the book of Acts. We've been making our, our way through this awesome book. I don't know about you, but Acts is kind of like one of those movies that you can watch over and over again. Um, Caleb found this uh, this movie in the in the kind of movie library, Nacho Libre. I don't know if you've watched Nacho Libre, but it's like one of these classic funny movies. And um, I don't know. I sat down there on the couch for like just a couple of minutes, and I was like, man, I got to watch this movie again. And and it's like the Bible has that and like so much more because every time we go through these these books of the bible they're fresh it's not like a one of those uh, uh novels that we would read maybe uh, i mean i know everybody's got maybe their favorite novel or whatever that they go back to but this is fresh all the time it's because the holy spirit is kind of alive in its pages you know and so today we kind of like mark the midpoint of uh, of acts chapter 23 um, and it's been an awesome journey, right from chapter 1, right through chapter 2, and we've kind of seen how the church has been established, this organization that's been established by God Himself, and now we've been kind of going through and seeing how the Gentiles have been added to the church, and, and uh, that was in chapter chapter 10. And so we find ourselves, if you're historianly, or you kind of like, like the history, we find ourselves between the AD 44 and AD 47, Right? Um, to be exact, about eight years since Pentecost. Uh, there was eight years between uh, Pentecost and um, Cornelius, right? Back in chapter 10, it was about three weeks ago. And then another eight years after Cornelius to now where we are here. And this is the mark of the beginning of Paul's missionary journeys. The first of an epic three journeys, right? And in the between, they're going to have the council in Jerusalem, which is going to be interesting too, um, because they're going to discuss a whole lot of interesting topics over there. And um, then, uh, and then, and then Paul's going to obviously have his final journey towards Rome, where he's eventually going to be martyred. 
kind of like waiting for the lights to go off any moment. <laughs> but anyway, so, so if you're that way inclined, that's where we are at this moment. And so in chapter 11, we found um, kind of like Peter explained himself to, to the, the church in Jerusalem about how um, the Gentiles have been added in and grafted into the vine that is of Israel. And then uh, in chapter 12, we found uh, the martyr, of, uh, James gets martyred, and um, there's a prison break, Peter gets out, and then uh, there's this establishment of this church that we're going to get into today. Ah, oh, there it goes. There we are. There's a couple of lights over there, and we put them on over there. Why don't you move that one actually ever is kind of like put it against the wall over there? Yeah. Alrighty. Fortunately, we're not going to have air con or anything like that, but um, I think we should be Is there another light against that wall over there? Maybe someone can just quickly put it on. It's a good thing that no one's afraid of the dark. <laughs> Alrighty, thanks guys. So, at the end of chapter 12, we read in chapter 25, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, um, whose other name was Mark. Right? And so the first kind of character that we get to, to, to see in this, uh, in this story is John Mark. Right? He's an interesting guy. Um, he's a huge blessing to Paul and Barnabas. Um, in the, on the first missionary journey, but we find out uh, uh, just be, just after we stopped this morning, he's gonna he's gonna leave Paul and Barnabas, right? And he kind of deserts them on their first missionary journey, and it creates a big divide in a way. Because in chapter 15, Paul says, "Let's do this thing again." Barnabas is going, "Yeah, cool. Let's go to Mark's house and go and pick him up." And Paul's like, "It's not gonna happen. He's deserted us once." I'm not taking with us again, right? And the Bible is kind of like unsure why he did this, right? And, um, and so there's no small disagreement as chapter 15 kind of tells us. And they, Paul and Barnabas actually split, split paths, right? Paul takes Silas and he goes on his second, uh, second missionary journey. And then um, and, and Barnabas takes Paul. And, um, and they, they go on their way. And, and actually what happens is that, that Mark spends a lot of time with Peter in Jerusalem, right? And uh, he ends up being the author of the Gospel of Mark, right? He's not an eyewitness himself, but he's actually um, pinning down everything that he learned from Peter. It's pretty awesome. And if you're wondering, like uh, I, I often wonder, is that did this relationship ever get like patched up between uh, Mark and uh, and Paul? I'm not going to tell you now because you're going to have to come back in uh, in, uh, in back. Well, actually, we're not going to get into it in Acts. In in Timothy, first book of Timothy, Paul actually requests um, for uh, Mark to come to him in prison in Rome because he says he's good for the ministry. And it's such a cool story. But anyway, we're not going to be there right now. We've got this, um, this team, Barnabas and Saul, and they're on their way to Antioch, right? And uh, Paul and Barnabas, you're going to see, they're kind of like this good cop, bad cop. Paul's, um, uh, well, Paul at this moment is called Saul, but we all know the fiery Saul, right? We know it from his letters. But Paul, Paul's name means son of encouragement, right? Son of consolation. So he's, and we can see that um, he's established this church in Corinth. Um, and, and both of these guys are actually responsible for the birth of this church in, did I say Corinth? Eh? In Antioch, right? They're both responsible. Paul, in a bad way, he martyrs Stephen when he's still a Pharisee. And uh, they scattered um, northwards towards um, Syria, going to um, Samaria and up into Syria as to Syria and even to Cyprus and so in a bad way he sends Christians to Antioch right but then when the church finds out about Antioch they send Barnabas and Barnabas then at this stage he kind of like encourages this church and then he goes and fetches Paul and he brings Paul and they actually live in at Antioch for a year right and they establish this church and so from now on we're not going to hear much about Jerusalem we're going to hear about this 
headquarters of the, the church in, in, um, in Antioch and all of Paul's missionary journey. So let's read together. Sorry, that was a little bit of an introduction. Let's read together verses, um, the first three verses of um, chapter 13. And so now they were in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manane, the member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul, while they were worshipping, ministering to the Lord, and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And so let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this exciting journey that we're on with Paul and Barnabas. And Lord, we want to pray that you would illuminate to us your truth this morning. That Father God, we would become worshippers of you and of what you are doing, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would do something in our hearts this morning. Please, um, yeah, Lord Jesus, be in our midst as we don't have air con, Lord. May it uh, be pleasant for us if we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I think it's really cool as we look into this um, this this uh, text in, in uh, Acts. We get to actually kind of look at how the first church did things, right? And this first verse uh, says, "And now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, right?" And so I think that's quite cool, and I'm drawn to kind of like um, investigate that because when I see that in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers. I kind of think of prophets and I think, well, that's Old Testament, you know. But here it is, right over here, we have prophets, right? And so we at Calvary Chapel Paul, we believe in the gift of prophecy and we kind of believe in New Testament and what the New Testament talks about prophecy. But in, I know in some churches and in some movements and a lot of us and people that I've spoken to, even in our own um, church, um, this office of prophet has kind of been maybe used in, a, in the wrong context for manipulation. Um, some, in, in some contexts it, it's been used to, and it caused a lot of pain to people. And so in the church there, there's actually a lot of varying appear, uh, opinions with regards to this position of prophet within uh, the church. And so I thought we'd, we'd go there this, <laughs> this Sunday. Because uh, it's here it is, right here in Acts chapter 13, we say there are prophets and teachers. And so the question we go is that are the prophets in the New Testament the same as the prophets in the Old Testament? Right? Are they? Yes and no. Alright? We might go, okay, well in the Old Testament we read about, uh, you know, the prophet Ezekiel, prophet uh, Samuel. We've got all the prophets, actually. Right? But in the New Testament, you know, we don't read from the prophet Paul. We don't read from, or we talk, we read from the apostles, right? And so this position in the Old Testament, let's just quickly go back to Deuteronomy 18. This, this position was a really important position in the Old Testament. Check this out. In Deuteronomy 18 it says, The Lord, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me. It's talking about Moses. Moses is giving the word of God. From among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. I will raise up for them a prophet like you for, from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth. It's God speaking now. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or the, who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know that the word that the Lord has, that, sorry, how may we know um, the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you need not be afraid of him. Right? And so this was a heavy 
office within the Old Testament, right? If you said something and it didn't happen, you were proven immediately you were a prophet, right? And so, and then obviously we get the words of the prophet that we read all over the Old Testament. They had the authority of God to write scripture, right? And so our question is over here, so what does this now look like in the New Testament, right? Alright? Um, sorry, they had divine authority and they wrote the Word of God, right? And so, but when we look at New Testament Scripture, we don't read the book of Mark, you know, as a prophet. And so Hebrews 1 actually kind of puts this all into context for us. It says, uh, he starts off and the writer of the Hebrews says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. And so, Jesus was essentially everything that the Old Testament prophets were all pointing towards. Right? They were pointing towards Jesus. And so the official last Old Testament prophet was actually, was actually John the Baptist. Right? Before Jesus came. Right? And so now the question is, what well, we still have scripture. Who wrote scripture? And so this office of, of prophet is kind of like being passed on to the apostles, right? Which were the eyewitnesses of, of, of Jesus. And they were given the authority to pen down scripture. And if you go and study it into, into how the canons of scripture were put together, it was strict. You had to have known Jesus. You had to have, there was many books of gospels of this, but they, they were not put into the canons, right? And so, an interesting thing that we, we did study in, in Acts chapter 2, in the prophet Joel says, he says, In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. And so it, it comes to kind of like a conclusion is that, you know, there was this office of being a, a prophet by specific people. They were filled by God's spirit and they wrote scripture. And now it's kind of like we're, we, we're all filled with God's spirit and we're all able to prophesy. And that's really cool. But now... In, in this, uh, in this, in Acts chapter 13, it mentions these, these five men, right? And so, we want to still kind of get into the to, to what does this mean, right? And so, in the Old Testament, God gave His Spirit in the, in in His words to specific people, and so now there's, um, sorry, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, what Luke is describing here is that in Greek, this word "prophet" actually means to speak forth to speak out, to divulge, or to make known, or announce. It's a foretelling, or a, a, a foretelling, right? It's actually kind of like either telling the future, or it's actually just <coughs> revealing God's heart to us right now. And so, um, Paul then instructs in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, the prophecy is a, is a spiritual gift. And in 1, in, in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, the one who prophesies speaks to people for the upbuilding and the encouragement and consolation. And then if you go down to verse 39, it says, So my brothers earnestly desire prophecy. Right? And so clearly over here, we see that prophecy has its place within the New Testament church. And we, we as a church, we obviously want to go, we want a part of that. We want to see um, prophecy happen within Calvary Chapel Paul. And he's endorsing this this um, gift, right? Um, and people are built up by it. And so examples in the New Testament, if we look about it, in Acts chapter 11, we have the, the prophet that is probably the most kind of brought into attention in, in Acts is prophet Agabus, right? We see him in, in, in chapter 11. He, he uh, prophesies that there's going to be a drought, right? And so that's what Paul and Barnabas has actually been doing. They've been accumulating funds and taking money to, um, to Jerusalem to help the, the Jews out in their drought. And then we hear about him again in Acts 21, when Paul's about to be going on his missionary journey and, he, and he's going to Jerusalem to be, be uh, you know, beheaded. 
And um, Agabus again is on the beach with those guys, uh, the, the leaders of, of uh, Ephesus, and they're pleading with him. And uh, Agabus walks up, he takes uh, Paul's belt off, kind of straps up his legs and straps up his arms, and he says, so this will happen to the, to the owner of this belt. The Jews are going to bind you, and they're going to hand you over to the, the Romans. And I want to point something out that's really cool here in the New Testament prophecy is that what Agabus had actually said doesn't quite happen exactly the way that he says it. Actually, the Romans bind him and the Jews wouldn't give him over. And so there's like this prophecy in the New Testament is kind of like incomplete, right? And so how do we, it, it's not as accurate as Old Testament prophets. And then obviously we've got the book of Revelation, which is a, a whole prophecy on its own. Philip, who was a, the deacon, he has four daughters that prophesy. And so there's just evidence that within the New Testament church, there's this prophecy and, and that office of, uh, of prophet, right? And then obviously we're going to get into this this morning. Um, when they're worshipping, it says that the Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Paul. And we kind of want to say, like, how did the Spirit say that? You know, was it audible? No, these men were had a prophetic gifting and they heard God. Now, I was just thinking about it in the beginning of the year in February, um, us leaders, we went, about 10 of us, we went out to um, Hermanus, we ten, spent a time in fasting for about three days, fasting, worshipping, and it was an amazing time of what God was revealing to us. And we could say that was prophetic. It was God was speaking to us about the future, speaking to us about getting us excited, encouraging about His heart for the church. It's prophetic. And so this, this is evident right here. But in this pic picture is that Paul gives clear instructions to Thessalonians and Corinthians. And, and John speaks about it. He says in Thessalonians 5 verse 20, um, uh, 21, it says, Do not despise prophecies, but test everything and hold fast what is good. 1 John 4 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and 9 says, Love never ends at the that, that end of that beautiful song. Um, it says, For prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, and the, the, um, when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. And so it's this beautiful picture is that in the Old Testament, the prophets were kind of like a big position and they wrote the Word of God. Prophets now in the New Testament, they are, don't have the same office and of authority and, and over Scripture, but they have an important role in showing us as the children of God, the heart of of God, right? And so it's really important because I think we can be led astray. I know there's churches where they have prophets that go, thus says the, the Lord. I was speaking to someone the other day that had to leave a church because they got a prophet in to say, you need to sign off your, um, your resignation. You need to leave this church. And the prophet said it, so you need to get out. And it's like, who are we listening to over here? You know what I mean? And, and it becomes a scary place. And so us, you know, Paul says so many times, we, we don't want you to be ill-informed about these things, you know? And so Paul over here is, is saying there is an office, or sorry, Luke is saying there's an office for prophecy, but this is how it works within the New Testament, right? And so unfortunately with the abuse of it, people either tend to leave the thing and at all and go, prophecy is not for the New Testament. Or they go, or, or it's overused and it's abused, right? And so for us as a New Testament church, as Calvary Chapel, we want to walk that fine line in the middle, right? We want to be anchored to God's Word because this is God's Word. But we also know that the spiritual gifts are working. And so I want to be encouraged that I know that in this church there's prophetic gifts. I know through hanging out with people in life groups, right, that there's prophetic giftings that God gives to us that encourages our church. And so I want to put it out there as not a, let's 
steer away from it. It's like we should be anticipating what God is saying. And so when the church hears a word from the Lord, we should be encouraged to listen and be a part of that. Amen. And so, in the same way, what, what, what Luke says, he says, is that now they were in the church, right? And I, I want to kind of echo that. A prophecy works within the church, right? It's a, it's a place where God wants to, in the safety of the church, right? We might get it wrong sometimes. We might get it spot on, you know, but it's within the church. All right, and so Paul lets us know about these five guys. Um, he speaks about uh, Barnabas, and we know him. He's the son of consolation. He talks about Simeon, who was called Niger, comes from Nigeria area in North Africa. And um, it's actually believed that this guy actually was the guy that the, the centurions grabbed to carry Jesus' cross, right? And that he returned down to, to Cyrene, and he got this other guy who was called Lucius, right? And so we have these two African guys that are part of this Antioch church, right? Imagine having this guy Simeon who carried the cross uh, of Christ uh, in your church. That would have been awesome. And then we have this, this guy called Humane, who was actually a foster child of Herod the Tetrarch. And we had the whole Herod situation last week, which was really complicated. But he was Herod the Great, who actually beheaded um, John the Baptist. But he was, ra he was raised up with um, Herod's children. And so and then we have this guy, Saul, who we know really, really well from the, old, uh, from the New Testament. And uh, Saul actually changes his name. If you want to jump quickly to verse 9, uh, it says, uh, it says uh, and, and, sorry, verse 9 says, but Saul, who was also called Paul. And so from chapter 13, it's always re referring um, to Paul from now on. And so the, the meaning of Saul means requested one. Right? It, it, comes from, um, it comes from back in King Saul in the Old Testament when uh, the, the children request, the children of Israel requested a king. Right? And so they, they, Paul, uh, Saul is raised up to become king and it's, his name means requested one. But Paul means little. Right? And it's like, why would you change your name from requested one to little? And so as I was like kind of studying this, um, it's pretty cool that these theologians um, have noticed the way that Paul speaks of himself in his early letters compared to his later letters, right? And so early on in Ephesus, uh, sorry, to, the, to Ephesus, uh, uh, in, sorry, in Ephesians 3 verse 8, he says, I am the least of all the saints, right? So he calls himself a saint, but I'm the least of all the saints. In Romans, he says, I am a sinner, right? But at the end, in Timothy, when he's in the... In the um, in the dungeons, and he's writing to Timothy, what does he say? I am the chief of all sinners. And so the reminder is of as, as we grow in our walk with God, and as we, we grow in, in our relationship with God, and we grow close to Jesus, Jesus becomes great, and we become small. And Paul had this revelation that he was, um, Jesus is great, and he is small. And so... I know I'm laboring this first little section of, of these five guys, but there's these five diverse guys within um, this church here in Antioch. Um, we've got two um, uh, kind of Pharisee, um, raised Pharisee Jews. We have two um, Nigerians from North Africa. Uh, we've got Lucius and Simeon. And then we've got this aristocrat, um, well-to-do um, foster child from um, Herod. And they're all together. And the cool thing is, is that they're all worshipping, right? It says in chapter 2, is while they were worshipping to the Lord, um, while they were worshipping to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the, for the work that I have called them to. And so, a cool thing to, to look in, in, into, into how this all happens and how this first missionary journey um, comes together is that it first started in worship. It first started in worship. The, uh, in the New King James, uh, it, it, they actually uses the words as they ministered to the Lord, right? And and I like that because their ministry was first to the Lord and not to others, 
right? I mean, Barnabas and here are these five guys, they had left their land and country and their home. And here they were serving God and, and working for God in, in uh, Antioch. But their first service was to the Lord. And, and it's a great reminder for us that no matter what we do for God, our first service is for the Lord. And, and I think of that story of Mary and Martha that, uh, that, uh, that met. Martha is busy working, right? She's preparing food. But where is Mary? She's loving Jesus at the feet of Jesus. And so our first love is to, um, to the Lord. Um, and I was, I was just thinking in our prep time of, of Bryce and Sarah. And I, I think if, if all of us kind of like wanted to point out what we loved about Bryce, and I get the opportunity now, is that his love for Jesus. <coughs> His love for worshipping Jesus. If you just like whip out the guitar and say, hey, should we sing a few songs? He's like, yes, let's sing to Jesus together. You know what I mean? And so um, we got these examples right here in front of us is that our first ministry is to Jesus and to God. And then um, the second thing that, is that we, we get to see is that worship is the fuel behind missions, right? John Piper has this quote, um, it's so radical. It's, it's awesome. Listen to it. It says, Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions. Because God is ultimate and not man. When, when this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. If worship is the goal, the local church is the primary instru instrument. Or, to use a car analogy, if worship is both the des destination and the fuel of missions, the local church is the engine. Why? Because the local church is designed to be God's gathered worshippers on earth. A corporate display of His glory among the nations. And don't think that's beautiful? Worship and missions exist because worship doesn't. We want him to bring more worship. Missions is will come to an end, but worship will never Amen. come to an end. Right? Another important thing is um, within church, and, and I'm emphasizing it within church, is that missionaries are sent. Right? It's really important. We've got a lot of people that went, but few that are sent. Right? And um, and, and it's a safe place to be sent by a church, not to just go, right? And, 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 and I think we've, uh, uh, if we speak, we speak to, we've got the example of Bryce and Sarah. They were sent from Tustin to, um, uh, to South Africa, right? We, we, we've sent, um, I can't think of her name right now. Um, say again? Lundi. Lundi. We've sent Lundi off to uh, Uganda. Right? She's a missionary from us, sent to Yemen. Right? Unfortunately, it was all locked down and everything, and so we didn't bring her up here and lay hands on her, just like we see in this text. But we were doing that as a church. Cool. Let's get into this last section. It's, um, it's a big one, but it, it, it's... Um, let's, let's read it together from verse 4. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet called Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul, and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, and he said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about 
seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed, and when he saw what it, uh, when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And so Barnabas and Paul, with Mark, depart. They go on this first missionary journey, and they come to Cyprus, right? And I don't know if you know anything about Cyprus. But Cyprus is a, a, a little island that's off, kind of off the coast of Syria, and, um, and and Cyprus is known for the Roman worship of the of Venus, right? Aphrodite, right? The love goddess. And I think it's so funny because they they worship this 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 love goddess, but they they were enthralled into this this eros love, but true love was actually on its way. Right. Missions, the mission of love with Paul and, um, and Barnabas were actually on its way. All right. And so as they are making their way down through the island, they meet at the synagogue. So it was kind of like Paul's custom. He'd first go to the synagogue. He'd meet with um, uh, proselytes that were Greek or Roman that had been um, kind of like grafted into the, the uh, Jewish faith. And he would obviously meet with Jews and he would discuss um, Jesus being prophesied through the prophets and coming um, as the Messiah. And then um, all of a sudden we, we meet this, this bar Jesus, right? And this magician, this sorcerer, and he was kind of linked to this Roman leader, the proconsul Sergius Paulus. And um, uh, it was a beneficial, obviously part of kind of Greek and Roman mythology and all of that worship. There was this worship of, of sorcery, of something that was mysterious. And Sergius, we find out here, is actually a man of intelligence, which means that he wanted to kind of learn more. He was seeking truth. And obviously he had kind of like brought along this Bar Jesus. And um, Bar Jesus actually means son of Jesus, son of Yeshua, right? Um, and he's a sorcerer. And, and we get, given his other name is Ilimus, which means enlightened, right? Wise. Um, and so we're going to find out how how enlightened he is when he's actually blinded at the end of the story. But uh, in learning about Paul and, and Barnabas, this, this guy calls um, Sergius um, Paulus, he's, he calls Paul and Barnabas to come and meet with him, share. Him, and, and actually it says to us um, in uh, verse... Um, uh, is it, uh, he says to them that uh, he wants to hear the word of the Lord. It. But Elimus, the children, uh, uh, Elimus, the magician, opposed him and seeking him. And, sorry, verse seven. There's a verse seven. Right, and he was with the proconsul Sergius, and a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of the Lord. Right. But this sorcerer is now opposing him, and so Paul gets really, in, in, really intense with this guy. And in verse ten, he says, "You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, you will not." You will not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And this is pretty intense right now. And um, you can imagine how Barnabas, the son of encouragement, must be feeling right now. He's like, let's be kind, Paul, let's be kind. Right? But you might, we, we can look at this thing, and, and, and in my reading, it's like, this is a great victory for, for, for Christianity right here. And we can see the, the strength of the power of Jesus against witchcraft and, and sorcery and wizardry. But I, I think that's all right and all good. But there's something a little bit deeper in here and that, that kind of affects our daily lives. And Paul is fighting against God. He wasn't necessarily fighting against God, Jesus' magic. He was going against the fact that he was preventing Sergius Paulus from receiving the gospel and hearing God's word, right? That was the true evil in the situation, right? Bar Jesus was getting in the way of Sergius Paulus receiving the gospel. Magic is a cheap imitation of God's ultimate authority and power. And in this situation, Bar Jesus... And his magic was keeping Sergius Paul from receiving the gospel. He was getting in the way and Paul said to him, Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? God's straight path to Sergius was through Sergius' heart. And here we have this magic 
getting in the way. And so Paul has full right to get in right, uh, involved. And so, um, as a result, so just Paul, Paul like, then believes, and when we and, and he saw what happened. But the beautiful thing at the end of this, he says, um, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Right? He was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Yes, he had seen God's power and the victory over the powers of magic, but it was the teaching of the Lord that saved him. It was when Barnabas and Paul shared with him the gospel and told him about Jesus. Sergius Paulus might have worshipped the goddess of, the lo of love in Cyprus, but he had never met the God of true love until Paul and Barnabas had spoken with him. It's the picture of the gospel here. We are just like Sergius and Paulus, lost in our sin, blind to true love, feeding our flesh, unable to see sin for what it really is. But when Jesus comes and He deals Satan a fatal blow on the cross and His true power is on display, the result is our hearts are able to receive His love and to believe in His name. And so, what we have... Um, I want to finish off in, in this way. I, I really felt God speaking to me about like, what is our Cyprus? What is our bar Jesus in our Cyprus? Right? And I felt like, kind of like this, it was like to us as parents, and I got, I got, parent, uh, I got kids too. <laughs> I've got parents. I've got parents. I've got kids. Um, and uh, and, and I, I think to myself, they like Sergius Paulus. They're intelligent, we know this, but they're seeking, they're seeking us, right? And, and yet they're, they're, we've got these bar Jesuses in our lives, right? That kind of like prevent them from receiving the gospel, prevent them from receiving truth. And I was just, I was, I was thinking back of, of the first men's meeting of our, uh, when Bryce was talking to us about um, the battles that we have in our lives. And, and it kind of like put things into perspective for me because I, I realized we, we, there's a battle out there. But sometimes I'm fighting the wrong battle, right? Sometimes I'm, I'm fighting what's going on at work and, and this situation. And, and, and meanwhile, when I get home, I've got Sergius Paulus waiting for me. And, and sometimes there's, there's stuff in the way that I'm not fighting for him for. I'm not like Paul that stands up and says, get out of the way, right? And, and, and I just, I felt that it was kind of like a word for us as, as, a, as a church. And, and I know for all of us, I, as I said, I'm guilty of this thing. And I just think there's, there's Bar Jesus that are kind of evident in our life. And, and the funny thing about this name, this guy's name is Bar Jesus. It's the, his name was Son of Jesus, right? He looked good. He was enlightened. He was clever. He didn't have a trick or two, right? And if, what happened if Paul had never confronted by, by Jesus. You know? Would, would, would Sergius Paul of this have ever got the gospel? No. And, and I just think of the things that are going on in our lives where, that are preventing, and particularly for us kids, for our kids, that, that are, are like things that are like by Jesus, that are, are kind of cheap thrills, that are, that are kind of drawing our kids away, um, silly magic. I was just thinking, I remember growing up, my, my parents, they, I mean, we were never allowed to watch Harry Potter. It was just like, and I was like really angry about it. I was like, why? You know, like, I think it's, it's so cool, you know? And, and I was just thinking, I know now why in a way, because like, why? It's cheap thrills, man. It's just like, Bar Jesus was just getting in the way. It was kind of like this, 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 this thing that was just kind of keeping Sergius Paulus on the string, you know? Where the real power was Jesus. The real power was Jesus. And, and Paul had to get him out of the way. And, 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 and there's this huge uh, display. And I'm not saying that we need to get, <laughs> like, go to your local magician. Not that we have local magicians. You'll like, dial them up or whatever. But, and they kind of speak to him like this. But, but we as parents and fathers and father figures within our community have full right to get things out of the way from people receiving the gospel and particularly our children and young, young people. And so let's close and um, we'll get into communion. Um, I think we went a little bit long. Forgive me and it's getting super hot. Um, so let's pray together and uh, we'll get into communion. Father God, we, 
thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. And Lord, we, we realize that, um, that, Lord, you have done so much on the cross for, for, for removing those bar Jesuses out of our life. You removed Satan from, our, from, from his hold on us. And, and, and because you did that, Jesus, we were able to receive truth. And, and, and God, we, we want to be encouraged that, um, that God, there's, there is true power in your word. Um, and, and God, we want, to, we want to pray that, Lord Jesus, we come to this table that you have, you have laid before us. That, God, we would just bring our lives before you. And that you would reveal to us, Lord Jesus, um, the things that you have kind of stirred up in our hearts today. And that we'd be able to bring these things to you and be found at your table and be renewed. May, our, may our, uh, our eyes and our worship always just be for you alone, Jesus, and for nothing else. Lord, may we not be drawn away to work for you without serving and loving you alone. And so we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.